So as we come to our time in God's Word together this morning, we're going to be looking at the first of two messages in which we'll be examining what Scripture says about both eternal death and eternal life. In addition to this, we're going to be looking at the sequence of events that we see in Scripture regarding what happens from the point when an unbeliever dies and leaves this earth, and also what happens from the point when a believer dies and leaves this earth. A little bit different this morning. Children, your sheets, you have some uh, word search and colouring there. There won't be specific points on the screen, but you have some spaces there to write some things that you learn. There are outlines, as we said, if you want one of those to follow along. There won't be a PowerPoint this morning, but I'll be reading and turning to several scriptures as we go through. So let's just pray and we'll come to God's word together. Father, we thank you so much for the authority of your word that comes from your loving, sovereign, wise heart. Thank you that we can be here unhindered to hear your word, to worship you. And it is your very word that has called us to do this. Father, I pray this morning as we look at this subject, and somewhat a a difficult subject in many ways, that you would prepare our hearts, that you, by your word, by your spirit, would work in our hearts, and that you would have your way among us. Be glorified, we pray, through the preaching of your word, Lord. May we see Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. There are really only two categories of people in this world, and you'll see that's the first part of the outlines there if you're following along. When it comes to having a relationship with God or from God's perspective, and we are not talking about vaccinated and unvaccinated, of course. You are either saved and belong to God, which is what it means to be a Christian and a believer, or you are unsaved and therefore do not belong to God. And so those are people we would refer to as non-Christians or unbelievers. Now, just in case there's anyone who is less familiar with these terms, when we say believer, we are talking about a person who has repented, turned from their sin, and turned to God by placing their trust in Christ alone for salvation. When we say unbeliever, we are talking about a person who has rejected the good news of salvation offered through Christ, meaning that at their moment of death, they had not repented and had not placed their trust in Christ alone for salvation. The good news of the gospel, that message we proclaim as God's people, is that apart from Christ, none of us have any hope of entering heaven by our own good works. God is perfect, holy, just and righteous. And as human beings, we are sinful and fallen and have rejected God's rule over our lives. Because a holy God cannot just pass over sin and rebellion, he must bring judgment. And again, that's what leads to eternal death otherwise known as hell, but there's a bit more detail to that, which we'll look at later on. However, because of God's incredible love and mercy, he did what only he could do as a solution to this problem of sinful man inevitably facing the justice of a holy God. He became one of us in the form of Jesus Christ and lived a perfect life and then sacrificially gave his sinless life as an atonement for our sinful lives, dying in our place, and taking the punishment that was rightly ours. That is what happened upon that wooden cross in Rome just over 2,000 years ago. Then God tells us in his word that if anyone, upon hearing the good news, turns from their sins, choosing not to trust again in their own good works, but rather in the one good work of Jesus Christ, if they place their full trust in Christ alone for salvation, believing upon him by faith, they will be forgiven all sin, past, present, future, justified in the sight of a holy God and granted eternal life. What a message of hope that is. And so you can see why it's important to clarify the difference between a believer and an unbeliever. And as I hope you just heard, it has nothing to do with a particular sentimental moment of praying a sinner's prayer and asking Jesus into your heart because you decided it will be a nice thing to go to heaven. That is not the gospel. That, of course, does not mean that when a person becomes a Christian, there is never a defining or particular moment in time when they were aware of what happened, because that's true of many believers, including myself. Nor does it mean that a person who prayed some sinner's prayer wasn't saved at that moment, because That's also true of many believers, that they are saved, but it's not the moment or the prayer that saves a person. It's whether they've placed their trust in Christ alone for salvation upon believing and understanding the gospel. 
And of course, this only happens because the Holy Spirit draws a person to Christ, convicts them of their sin, and begins that work of regeneration in their hearts, making it possible for them to believe in Christ. In other words, when you lack assurance, you don't look for a little card that you signed when you made your decision and say, I must be okay. Instead, you ask yourself, am I trusting in Christ for salvation right now? Am I abiding in Christ right now? That's all that matters. So you can see why these distinctions of believer and unbeliever or saved and unsaved are important. A believer has been given the promise through Christ because of who Christ is and because of what Christ has done that when they eventually leave this earthly body, they will be with Christ in heaven for all eternity. In other words, they will enter into eternal life. The unbeliever, on the other hand, who leaves his or her earthly body, will be judged by God and receive the just punishment for their sins and as a result will be punished entering into eternal death. Of course, we'll be expanding on all this and that's the point of these messages But just turn with me to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, and I'll just read verse 12, which really puts so succinctly, or summarizes so succinctly, all that I've just said. 1 John 5 verse 12, which says, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Now, the beautiful thing about the gospel, of course, is that those who find themselves in the unsaved category can still find the eternal hope that is available through Christ by believing in the good news of the gospel that I've just described. Now, this is a message that I first taught in 2004 and then 2006 and have taught a couple of times since and sought to improve upon it each time. But I never taught it for this church here in the last three years we've been here. So you get to hear version 1.4.2.7 or something like that. (coughs) Now originally this study was presented as one message, but I realized after a while because there's a lot of content and some of the content is quite sobering, take some time to sink in, it'll be better to break it into two parts. Aren't you grateful for that? The only downside of this is that this first message is quite a heavy message because after all we're focusing on eternal death the sequence of events of what happens when an unbeliever dies. And when I taught this as one message, it at least gave the opportunity to lift things a little when we spent the latter part of the study looking at eternal life. But you'll just have to come back next week for that part. Now, having said this, I think it can do us a lot of good to spend time thinking about the plight of the unsaved. And I don't doubt that it will help to motivate us more towards sharing the gospel with the lost, which is exactly what it should do. Not only did Jesus speak more about hell than anyone else in the Bible, as John MacArthur states, Jesus spoke about hell more than everyone else in the Bible combined. And so it's a subject closely linked to his heart and something worthy of our consideration, difficult as it may be. Our world has become so focused on the now, on the earthly, temporal lives that we have. And even among believers these days, sadly, there's little focus on things of an eternal nature and the life that God has called us to beyond this world. Things trouble us about this world far more than things that should trouble us about the world to come. So I mentioned earlier how we have these two categories of people in the world, the saved and the unsaved. Now, though many would like to think it's possible, the fact is there is absolutely no middle ground between those two categories. God does not recognize nearly Christians or used to be Christians or even the idea that I've always been a Christian or I was born a Christian. God only sees believers and unbelievers who've become such at a certain moment in time when he drew them to himself to trust them for salvation. God only sees those who are for him and those who are against him. But you might say, What about those people that are not necessarily against God? In fact, they're quite sympathetic to the whole idea of Christianity. They just don't want to make any solid commitment or take things too far. They admit they're not with Jesus, but they wouldn't say they were against him. Well, listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 12, 30. He says, he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Elsewhere, he says, we are children of God or children of the devil. Now, it's true in Mark 9, 40, 
in case you had that come to mind and thought, hang on a second, Chris, <clears throat> that it does say, he who is not against us is on our side, but the context there is that of another believer from a different group, not an unbeliever. The fact is, every person alive is either for Jesus Christ or they are against Jesus Christ. Let's talk next about the inevitability of death for everyone. I'm sure it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that every single one of you in this room, at some point in your life, or probably many times, has thought about what is going to happen to you after you die. If there's one major common experience that every human being will have, whether they're a believer or an unbeliever, it is that of dying. Some of us may live until we're over 80 years old, and there are some of you in this room, praise God. Some of us may live until we're over 100 years old. I don't think there's any in this room. Some of us may not see next year or next month or even next week. Either way, the experience of death will eventually come to us all. It's just a matter of time. Now, generally speaking, particularly in our Western culture, death is an uncomfortable subject for many, and we don't really like to talk about it or think about it. We'd rather just push it out there somewhere to deal with later. Even through this whole COVID crisis of the past almost two years, there's been a lot of talk about avoiding death, but not much talk about what happens after death and how to prepare for that. And again, that's the church's greatest responsibility. None of us can avoid it, ultimately. The good news is our lives are in God's hands. He is the one who's appointed our days. As David says in Psalm 139.16, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. Of course, when it comes to the afterlife, there are various beliefs out there, a lot of speculation, opinions, a lot of wishful thinking. But the common reaction we see from most people is that of not thinking about death too much because the fact is we don't really know and the unknown tends to make us a little nervous. So that's why for many people it's easier to just ignore the subject altogether. The problem is ignoring something does not make it go away. And regardless of what we think or feel or believe, death is going to catch up with all of us one day. Ecclesiastes 8 verse 8 says, No one has power over the spirit to retain the spirit. No one has power in the day of death. There is no release from that war and wickedness will not deliver those who are given to it. As God's word states clearly there, we are all subject to the inevitability of death. So what about after death? What lies beyond the grave? Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, very important verse to know, <clears throat> says this, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. As it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. There are two significant truths we get from this verse, and this is in the outline. We see, firstly, that man dies only once. This refutes the idea of reincarnation and the notion that people can have multiple past lives. The second truth we get from this verse is that after death comes what? Judgment for everyone, believer and non-believer alike, except they are very different types of judgment. There are a couple of exceptions to the dying once part, of course, you may have already thought, but God is God and he can make exceptions whenever he wants. Think of Lazarus, for example. He died, was raised from the dead, and at some point would have died again. And of course, the funny thing about that story is the Pharisees are so upset that he came back to life, they said, let's get him and kill him. <laughs> the same is also true for the widow's son and Jairus' daughter. <clears throat> and then there's the Old Testament case of Enoch and Elijah. They didn't die at all. They were just taken. They got a VIP shortcut straight to glory. Wouldn't you like that? But generally speaking, unless God intervenes, man dies only once and death itself is inevitable for everyone. Okay, let's move on now to look at the two eternal destinations for all human beings, depending whether they are a believer or an unbeliever. <clears throat> 
Something that has been a cause for controversy and debate at times within the church is the issue of whether our souls are eternal or not. When we pass from these earthly bodies, do we just go on and on, or is there a finishing point? I believe scripture makes it very clear that every single person that has ever lived or ever will live, once they've ceased to exist in their earthly bodies due to the inevitability of death, will spend the rest of their existence as a soul in either eternal death or eternal life. We are eternal souls, which is to describe further what we talk of when we say hell or heaven. Now, as with the categories of believer and unbeliever, there's no middle ground here. There are some that try to teach that in various ways, but it simply isn't biblical. And those who promote such views are refusing to let God be God, or at least trying. The doctrine of annihilation, for example, teaching that all those sentenced to hell just stop existing altogether rather than facing eternal punishment. Those people who believe that say, well, a God of love would never punish people eternally, they just stop existing. But not only is it not logical, far more importantly, it's not biblical. How can someone who sins against an eternal God expect a temporary punishment if God is to be just? In Hebrews 6 from verse 1, the author lists some things he considers foundational and basic to the Christian faith. Listen to what's included in that list. Hebrews 6, 1, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles, the ABCs of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. The Greek word used for eternal there, <clears throat> and in many other places, means something very interesting. It means eternal, without beginning and without end. How could someone like Hitler, responsible for the death of millions, be justly punished if all that were to happen to him was that he stopped existing, never experiencing any remorse or lasting sorrow for his actions? What did Jesus say of Judas who betrayed him? It will be good for that man if he had never been born. And then you have the doctrine of universalism, teaching that eventually everyone will be saved, whether they go to heaven or hell initially or not. Even if they go to hell, eventually they'll be sick of it and repent and go to heaven is what it teaches. And with that teaching, sadly, what it means is that hell itself becomes a means of grace for salvation, if you think about it. Universalists have slightly different perspectives among themselves, but they believe that ultimately all people end up in heaven. The problem with this teaching is it completely denies and blasphemes against the sacrificial death of Christ to save people from sin and grant them eternal life. If universalism were true, there would not be only no motivation to preach the gospel or live godly lives, but no reason or need either. If it doesn't matter how you live, because ultimately we'll all end up in heaven, then there's no need for sanctification in the life of a believer. With the teaching of universalism, there's no punishment for sin. If there's no punishment, there's no sin. If there's no sin, there's no saviour. If there's no saviour, there's no God. And if there's no God, there's no point in living like there is. Aside from that, universalism totally neglects the fact that God is both glorified in his justice when he punishes sinners, and he's glorified in his mercy as he saves sinners. As already mentioned before in Hebrews 9.27, judgment follows death. The punishment given by God for rejecting his offer of salvation is not temporal but eternal and not something you can change after you've died. In other words, there is no repentance after death. Now I find that most of the time, the greatest drive for people to adopt these false doctrines is they just cannot reconcile in their mind that a loving God would carry out eternal punishment. But listen carefully. Not understanding or accepting who God is and how he chooses to act is never a good basis for looking at alternative views. As we go through our study today, we'll see more reasons why these heretical ideas of annihilation and universalism just don't stand when held up against biblical truth. And I hope it will be clear to us all there are only two destinations, eternal death or eternal life. 
Now, one of the main things that distinguishes a believer from an unbeliever or a saved person from an unsaved person is what happens when they die. And it's whether they're still in their sins or not. I didn't say whether they still sin or not, but whether they're still in their sins, positionally speaking. Turn with me to Romans chapter 6. Verse 23, you know it well. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. When a person places their trust in Christ, it means they've come to the point of recognizing they are a sinner. Their sin has earned them punishment. They acknowledge they've broken God's commandments, so they repent. They turn from a life of trusting in themselves and instead trust in Christ and his finished work upon the cross. But if a person's response to the gospel is not repentance, there is no forgiveness for their sin, so they are still in their sins. That is the issue. They will face God's justice. Listen to what Jesus says in John 8, 24, as he speaks to the scribes and the Pharisees who refuse to believe in him. He says, Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. You never want to die in your sins. So having established that there are two eternal destinations, depending upon whether a person is a believer and resulting in either condemnation or justification, Let's look at the sequence of events for a person in each category once they've passed from this life. And first, and for this message today, we'll look at the unbeliever. And next week, we'll look at the sequence of events for the believer. Now, when seeking this information, it's vital that our only source is the Word of God. It cannot be the latest book about someone's private visit to heaven, supposedly, or some video about a professing believer's out-of-body experience. It just frustrates me how many Christians put so much weight on a YouTube video as truth when it's completely contradictory to God's Word. All of that information is subjective. We cannot find truth that way. We look to God's Word as the objective basis of truth because it is truth. Now, as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> some of the content we're going to be looking at now, especially in one go, can be quite disturbing, but I think it's necessary for us to get a proper grasp of what eternal death is really all about, what it means to reject Christ. We shouldn't try to shy away from or sanitize these truths. We need to be familiar with all of God's truth in his word, the easy parts and the hard parts. But let's face it, when we talk about the subject of hell, we should be disturbed by it. And with regard to our children here in this, this is reality. We should want them to know the truth also. The burden of knowing that many in this world are heading to eternal death without Christ should be a heavy burden in a believer's life. Jesus bore this burden, we should too. In fact, Jesus was described in Isaiah 53, 3, as a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Now, because he brought the solution to this, he was also a man who was full of joy unspeakable. Both of those things at the same time. It's interesting that even some of the most stubborn atheists and agnostics have realized on their deathbed that they needed God. It didn't necessarily mean that they all repented. For some, their hearts grew harder. Like a gentleman by the name of Sir Francis Newport, who was the head of the English Infidel Club, he said the following to those gathered around his deathbed. Do not tell me there is no God, for I know there is one, and I, I am in his angry presence. You need not tell me there is no hell, for I already feel my soul slipping into its fires. Wretches, cease your idle talk about there being any hope for me. I know that I am lost forever. What a tragic statement to utter on your deathbed. Even more tragic, there was no one there at that moment who could have brought hope. Then there was Professor J.H. Huxley, the famous agnostic, who as he lay dying, suddenly looked up at something invisible to everyone else around him, and after staring for a while, whispered, so it is true, realizing that he'd lived a lie. What about Voltaire, another famous skeptic, 
It is said of him that he died a terrible death. His nurse at the time said, for all the money in Europe, I wouldn't want to see another unbeliever die. All night long, he cried for forgiveness. Now, the encouraging thing about that is if he was sincere, he would have been forgiven. So what happens when the unbeliever dies? Well, let's look at a passage in Luke, chapter 16, where we find an example both of an unbeliever and a believer dying and the events that follow afterwards. Luke 16, and we'll spend some time in this passage here. Verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers that you may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. That last verse is very important because it reminds us, unless God's word convicts a person of the reality of hell, somebody supposedly coming back and telling everybody is not going to have a better effect. A few things to note about this passage. Firstly, Jesus does not specifically state this to be a parable, and he also uses specific names. Two characteristics that are unique compared to most of Jesus' other parables. Now, because of this, I've always seen no reason to not consider this to be a true story rather than a parable. However, there are some who would say they believe this is still a parable, and Jesus is using this story to illustrate, illustrate sorry, biblical truth, as he does in all of his parables. Now, I agree this would help to explain why some of the finer details here could be taken as more earthly descriptions of eternal realities rather than to be seen as literal, especially when we contrast what we see here with the whole counsel of God. Now, that will be true of such things as the beggar being carried to Abraham's bosom by angels. There's nothing else necessarily in Scripture to suggest that's what happens when believers die, that we get transported by angels. And also the descriptions of how people see and hear and communicate with each other would seem to be more illustrative that Jesus is using to make his point, but could be almost contradictory if we were to line up what the rest of Scripture talks about, the reality of hell. Either way, there are several key things in this parable that are very sobering to consider that Jesus obviously wanted us to grasp. And so we mustn't miss the key points that Jesus is communicating here within this story. So there's a few different takes out there is what I'm saying on this passage. Abraham's bosom was a name that was often given to the place known as Hades in verse 23. In the Old Testament, Hades is translated as Sheol, which was commonly understood as the abode for the dead, both the wicked and the righteous. And this would be like when David says, if I take my wings and descend to the deepest parts of Sheol, of hell, you will be there. Well, that's what he's talking about. Hades is often described by commentators as a waiting place until the day of final judgment, which we'll see shortly in Revelation chapter 20. That is the view I take simply because, as we'll see, there seems to be a progression from Hades to the lake of fire. So to lump it all as one place would seem inconsistent. There are some truths that we can glean from this passage. I'll just rattle off a few in regard to unbelievers who die and go to Hades. Hades. 
In verses 23 and 26, we see they're separated from the believers. In verses 23 and 25, 225, we see they're being tormented by some sort of supernatural fire without any relief. They're, they're in torment. In verse 24, we see they're conscious and aware of all that is happening to them, though I don't believe this is reason to believe they can talk or see outside of where they are, but I think it's communicating there is a consciousness of the suffering. I don't think we need to go beyond that. What we also see in verses 27 and 28 is they are remorseful and will forever regret their denial of God. And this is a key point. How can a just punishment exist if there's no lasting remorse? It's also worth noting there's not one time when the rich man asks to get out because he knows he can't. Now what we see in this passage is the incredible contrast between the rich man and the poor man. The rich man thought he had everything in this world, but he ended up having nothing, and all he did have meant nothing because he ended up in eternal torment. Then you have the poor man who looked like he had nothing in this world, mocked by many, but ended up having everything, finding himself in heavenly paradise alongside Abraham in eternal bliss. The rich man who ended up in torment was told the following truth, and it must have devastated him. He was told, in your lifetime, you received your good things. So I'll say to the believers, when you look out there and you sometimes covet or struggle with the many good things that those who don't profess Christ have, just remember that it's only in this world they receive those good things. There are many unbelievers who are do doing well in life, so it seems they're prospering in business, some become rich and famous, some even get to the level of receiving man's worship. But all of that means nothing when they find themselves in Hades and hear those words, in your lifetime you received your good things. And where did that lead you? Right here, to the pit of hell, where all that awaits you are bad things, horrific things, forever and ever. Hell is a terrible place, an unbearable place that the soul has to bear for eternity without end. It's hard to imagine pain and suffering without end. Our brains do not allow us to do that. It just goes on and on and on, and it should disturb us because it's unbearable to think about. So even as believers, when we consider that, I think we just shut it off because we, we, can't, we just can't handle thinking about that, especially when we put a face we know to that thought. Those that live to please themselves, reject Christ, and take no thought of the afterlife have made their own decision to go to hell by rejecting the Son of God who was sent to this earth to save them from their sins. In John 5.40, Jesus says, You are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Those words will echo for all eternity to the unbeliever that rejects Christ. You were not willing. God has no pleasure when he sees people perish, even those who hate and blaspheme his name. Ezekiel 33, 11. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? One thing I've been really convicted on each time I've taught this message is how important it is to not be flippant or light-hearted any time we talk about hell. Hell is never to be a funny topic among Christians. It's too tragic to be trivial. We find it distasteful to joke about disasters and death, and so how much more when we're talking about eternal death, never-ending torment, constant agony and pain forever and ever and ever. It should break our hearts as it does God's. Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and no wonder, because he understood what hell was like more than anyone else. So in terms of the sequence of events for the unbeliever here, this is what we can glean from this passage. And this is in your outline. Firstly, their soul is transported immediately to Hades where they suffer excruciating torment without rest. Again, that is hard to consider. In my work in the past as a paramedic, there's been many a time where I've stood over a dead body that has just died and 
every reason to believe they're not a believer. And just in my mind, just going back and forth, it's like, not could it really be, not questioning, but just letting it sink in, like, right now, that, that person is facing the wrath of God. All the unbelievers who've died since the beginning of time and all the unbelievers who will die in the future go immediately to Hades, Hell, Shoal, where they wait in torment for the second death, which is what we're going to look at next. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 20. <clears throat> Revelation 20. I will say as well that just as I believe it is wrong for us to be flippant and light-hearted about the subject of hell, it is also wrong to talk about hell in a harsh, incompassionate way, just screaming fire and brimstone at people with no grace or love. We speak truth, but we speak truth in love with broken hearts. <clears throat> Verse 11 of Revelation 20. This is the Apostle John talking about his vision. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then... Death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. <clears throat> now this is referring to that point in the future after the 1,000 year reign of Christ and before the new heavens and the new earth. Of course, you can't teach this subject without taking an eschatological position. So you'll be pleased to know I've been careful to take the correct eschatological position so I don't cause any confusion. So at this point then, the unbelieving dead are delivered up from Hades. You see this. Into the presence of God. No doubt, still in torments. And then they are judged. And lastly, they are cast into what is called the lake of fire. An even worse punishment if there could be such a thing than Hades was. Now you notice the reference there, <clears throat> excuse me, to something called the book of life. This is mentioned eight or nine times in total throughout the New Testament. And it refers to that divine record kept in heaven of those people who are true believers, known from before the foundation of the earth. A person who's truly saved is going to have their name in the book of life. A person who isn't won't. And it's those people Revelation 20 is describing. What a tragedy to have had your name up in lights and had millions of people idolise you. But you get to the end of your life, you find yourself standing before God Almighty to realise that your name is not in the most place, important place of all, the book of life. The reason it's called the book of life is because it's only those people who have their name in it that will receive life. Everyone else will only inherit the terrible fate of eternal death. Verse 12 <clears throat> talks about other books. Many Bible commentators believe this to be talking about the divine records of our works, including our hidden thoughts, our motives, all our sins. Remember, for the unbeliever, all things are exposed and judged. For the believer, all of our sin has been covered. When we give account, it's unto reward. Those works that are done in faith, we are rewarded for. Everything else is covered by Christ. We don't answer for our sin as believers. We'll see this next week. Now, this isn't saying <clears throat> that, sorry, this is referring to unbelievers, of course, with the works. Those who have rejected God will have to give account for every sinful action be judged according to their works. So let's go through the sequence of events that we see here. And this is in the outline. Secondly, at the second resurrection, after the millennium, the unbelievers are brought before God for the great white throne judgment. You have the first resurrection, the second resurrection is for unbelievers. They are brought before God in judgment. Third, the books that contain each person's works are opened and they're judged according to their works. Sometimes it's just 
heartbreaking to see what people get away with in this world. But we have to know that they will never get away with it. All sin of those who reject God will be punished. They will give account. Fourth, the severity of punishment is determined for each individual according to their works. We'll talk about that in a moment. They're judged according to their works. Of course, some will have more evil works than others, greater evil works than others. And then fifthly and finally, they're cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. So we'll come back and talk about this a bit, but that, that's the sequence of events. Second resurrection, the unbelievers are brought before God for the great white throne judgment. The books that contain each person's works are open. They're judged according to their works. Fourth, the severity of punishment is determined for each individual. And fifthly and finally, they're cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. The picture here is that of a trial, but not a trial awaiting a verdict. Because at this point, the people have been found guilty and are now standing to receive their sentence, which will come in varying degrees of eternal punishment. Now, this idea of varying degrees of punishment is spoken of by Jesus in John 19, 11, when he talks of Jesus, Judas, sorry, ugh, tongue twister, Judas. John 19, 11, Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, listen to these words, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Speaking of Judas, greater sin. Greater sin receives greater punishment, right? We know that even in the way that we've made in the image of God. An additional proof that there are different degrees or levels of hell is found in the statements of Jesus when he talks about the cities that rejected his ministry. In Matthew 11 from verse 21, he says, Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, listen to what he says, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you have been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Now make no mistake about it, all of hell is going to be horrible. But there will obviously be different levels of punishment according to the sins committed. And we can't really go into more detail than that because there isn't any. What's it going to be like in this lake of fire? Again, it will be eternally unbearable. If you look at verse 10 of Revelation 20, just before the passage we read before, we see that prior to the judgment of the unbelieving dead, Satan will be cast into this lake of fire. And it again describes what it is. Verse 10, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Same place that the unbelievers go to. In Mark 9, 42, Jesus talks about how nothing is worth holding on to at the risk of ending up in hell. He says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it will be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Again, you see a degree. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed than having two hands go to hell in the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. Children, this does not mean we cut off our hands and our feet. I don't want to get in trouble with parents. I actually thought this when I had been saved for about a month. I, I can tell you, I was, I was tormented. Realising I'd sinned with my hands and my feet, looking at another friend who was just recently saved, saying, what, what do we do? Like, is this what we've got to do? And we, it's not that we wanted to do it, we prepared, but we were, we were saved, so we felt the weight, well, I guess if that's what it says, but what, this is a bit heavy. But he's saying, whatever you hold on to in this life, because you say, I want to receive the things in this world that causes you to go to hell for all eternity, is not worth holding on to. So cut off your hand, cut off your foot. How else is this lake of fire described? I, I'm sorry to have to say these things because I know they're heavy, but it's not like this every week here. 
to the, to the visitors. This is a necessary time. Here are some other references to the eternal fate of those that reject Christ. Everlasting fire, Matthew 18. Weeping and gnashing of teeth, Matthew 22. Everlasting punishment, Matthew 25. Everlasting chains, Jude. Eternal damnation, Mark 3. Eternal judgment, Hebrews 6. Eternal fire, Jude 1. Unquenchable fire, Matthew 3. The fire that shall never be quenched, Mark 9. Fire unquenchable, Luke 3. Mist of darkness reserved forever, 2 Peter 2. And the blackness of darkness forever, Jude. How could anybody ever want to have that unimaginable fate ahead of them once they die and leave their body? There's not one single verse in the entire Bible that offers a single bit of hope for a soul in hell. Universalism is not true. Hell is eternal. Annihilationism is not true. It is too late when a person has breathed their last. Their eternity is sealed. That is why when we talk about having a deathbed conversion or going to speak to someone who is just moments away from death, you do not want to rest your hope in someone saying, I spent some time with them and they asked Jesus into their heart and go, oh, praise God. You want to have some assurance that that person trusted in Christ and repented. It may be that that happened through praying a prayer. But we don't just hinge it on, well, let's just get them to pray the prayer, then they're good. No, let's pray and give the gospel and pray they repent. The shocking thing is that thousands of lost people in this world have plunged into Hades and are awaiting the lake of fire since I began this message this morning. Thousands. It should trouble us far more than the risk of catching a virus. And that's important to remember. I say that because we have a church weak church in New Zealand right now that can be brought to its knees through fear of catching a virus but is not on its knees praying for those who are going to hell for all eternity. And I hope this gives us fresh motivation for sharing the gospel with the lost and for overcoming our fears of opening our mouths to share Christ, to be willing to ask God to help us get out of our comfort zones, to bring the good news to those who are perishing. We all have people we know, people we love, who are heading for that place of eternal torment if they don't repent, don't we? we, can, we they come to our minds straight away. What should our response be then? Do we run home, grab them by the collar, try to bring them to their senses? No, we need to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Doesn't mean we shouldn't have an urgency about this, because we should. There should always be an urgency to communicate the gospel to lost loved ones early. But for many of us, I realize what is most difficult is when we've loved ones that we have shared the gospel with, maybe a number of times, but they still haven't responded. I know that's the burden on many of your hearts right now. You've, I've told them, we've said it to them, they've come to church, they've read a tract, but they just haven't responded. What can we do in those situations? In those situations, pray, of course. <laughs> the best possible thing we can do is to not keep going at them with all our energy and zeal, but to go to God. With all we have, with all our lives, living for him in obedience and faith. Remember, salvation is not our job, it is God's. It is our responsibility to share the gospel, which is where the power is, and leave the results in God's hands, as we live for him and back up what we've shared with our lives. <clears throat> So don't say, that I just don't know what to do, there's nothing else I can do. Yes, there is. You live for Christ. You'd be the best example of a Christian on this planet for that lost person. Don't give them a single reason to look at your life and say, why would I want that? They don't respond any differently when everyone's running around scared wearing masks. Romans 1.16. Listen carefully to these words. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. I hope that this message today helps us to feel less ashamed. And how coming face to face with the reality of hell gives us the necessary motivation we need. God has given you the ability to lead someone from heading in that direction to eternal death, to instead have eternal life. One last verse to leave you with this morning is Romans 6.23, which I read earlier. For the wages of sin is death. We've looked in some detail this morning at that, eternal death. 
But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God has gone to incredible lengths to make it possible for those who are heading to eternal death to be saved from that plight and instead head to eternal life through Christ. And next week, that is what our focus will be as we look at the sequence of events that follows death for the believer, those who have placed their trust in Christ. We have gospel tracts available, as we say most times, on the table out there. We have the gospel on our website, if you ever want to point someone there. I and others here are happy to talk to anyone here whose heart might be stirred because you recognize that you are not in Christ. May God's love bring you to repentance. May his goodness bring you to repentance. You do not have to face that, that place. And I know this has been a heavy subject, but I appreciate that you've been patient. Um, if I seem a little excitable, it's because I ha haven't actually been in this pulpit for six months. <laughs> been preaching in the kitchen. So it's a blessing to be here. I'm going to pray, and then David Sims is going to come up and lead us to the Lord's table. What, a, what an awesome thing that we can remind ourselves through communion of the hope that we have in Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. And Lord, it is so true that though those words are difficult, they are words of life. Thank you, Lord, that you speak to us difficult truth because you want us to have life in you. Thank you that you give us a gospel that exposes sin so that they can embrace the Saviour. Thank you, Lord, that you give us a mirror to look into, to realise how far short we fall, so that you can show us how you have fulfilled the law in Christ and made every provision for our salvation. Father, I pray today that our hearts will be stirred, not in some knee-jerk reaction, not in some temporary work in our own strength, but as we reflect on these things, Lord, that we truly would be firstly so thankful that because of you, we have escaped these things that we've heard about. But also because of you, we can go into all the world and bring hope and life to the lost. We pray for our loved ones, Lord, those who came into our minds and our hearts just earlier, that break our hearts, Lord, convict them. Bring them to know you, Lord. Don't let them leave this earth without knowing you. And Lord, do whatever it takes to wake them up, to convict them of their sin. Work in their hearts by your Spirit. Draw them to yourself, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.